using a passport this summer? I am. And as the summer gets further along, I'm more and more excited uh, to put this thing into play. I plan to see some things that um, I haven't seen before. In fact, things I cannot see without a passport in the next several weeks. For instance, one of the things I hope to see is this volcano called Arenal. This is a, a, a towering volcano 5,400 feet above the landscape around it. It's considered to be a rather young volcano, only 7,500 years old. And it has been um, mostly dormant for um, hundreds of years until 1968 when it began erupting for 42 years in a row. It erupted. So even though now it's mostly dormant, a good friend told me, hey, make sure you look at it at night because you might see something happening at nighttime. So I'm excited to see this with my passport. From far enough away that that lava is not on me. That big water, maybe you see. <laughs> Another thing I hope to see is this waterfall. This is called La Fortuna Falls. Anyone been there? Kelsey has. Good morning, Kelsey. La Fortuna is a waterfall that falls at almost 230 feet near another volcano. And um, my understanding is there's a stairway of almost 500 steps that you can descend down into the uh, area where you can swim in the blue waters under the sprinkling and in little rapids below. In fact, the rivers near this volcano, I mean near this, are um, such that they form like natural hot tubs in the river because the water are, is heated by volcanic activity in that area. So there's a river and there's all these little pools that people have made so you can sit in it and just you know, enjoy a hot tub type effect. And I'm excited to see that with my passport. Finally, I'm excited to see this. Uh, this is Manuel Antonio National Park, the, apparently the most popular park in the country with one of the most diverse combinations of wildlife anywhere in the world. It includes both, uh, it includes both a beachfront and a rainforest, and all of this wild diversity. Um, couldn't fit too many pictures in ways that are visible to you here. Um, one of the things I really hope to see is this creature. Um, this is a three-toed sloth. But more than just see this guy, I hope to be this guy <laughs> while I'm on vacation <laughs> with my passport. <laughs> Anybody ever, anybody ever read your passport? I've had a couple of them. I never thought to read it. I made an assumption about this passport. I really, I thought it was basically just a more muscular kind of foolproof identity card, which it kind of is, but that assumption is just small by comparison to what it actually is. If you open your passport to page one, you would see this statement. This is the right in the very beginning. The Secretary of State of the United States of America hereby requests all whom it may concern to permit the citizen or national of the United States named herein to pass without delay or hindrance and in case of need to give all lawful aid and protection. The Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, currently, of the United States of America makes request on my behalf that I may be, be given access without hindrance. <laughs> and in case of need, that I be given aid and protection. The U.S. Secretary of State facilitates access for me to see some of the many wonders of this world. Thanks, Anthony Blinken. Interestingly enough, this is very similar to the way the Apostle Paul describes what Jesus Christ does for humanity 
but on the internal, eternal, and existential realms. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, as Barbara mentions, on page 917 in the Bibles near you, if that's helpful. And I will tell you as you turn your way there that Romans is Paul's final letter, we think. It's uh, his grand finale. It's his um, doctoral dissertation. After 30 years of thinking about Jesus, Paul writes this letter to the Romans. And we see in the letter to the Romans some clear markers of development or evolution in Paul's understanding of God. He doesn't think about God the same way he did back when he wrote 1 Thessalonians three decades earlier. Now, this evolution or development of his faith is uh, the universal curve of all healthy faith. Healthy Christians do not conceive of God the same way at age 50 that you did at age 5 or 15. Faith is an ongoing journey. That's why we call it formation. It's a lifelong project, and Paul demonstrates his own theological development in Romans as his kind of grand finale or his doctoral dissertation. One thing Paul doesn't develop very well is clarity of writing. I wish he would have had a better grammar teacher, <laughs> because if you read some of Paul's language, you find that uh, his sentences would be really tough to diagram if you're of the age of knowing what that is. Dangling modifiers, dangling participles, and uh, run-on sentences, and other modifiers that don't point clearly to their antecedents or the things they're trying to demonstrate. It, Paul is notorious for this. Romans does not read like the books we read to second graders to teach them clear thinking about things. So what I hope to do today is take some of Paul's doctoral dissertation and pull out some phrases that we can focus on as what Paul is attempting to communicate to Rome, to the church, what he has grown to understand about Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5 is where we're looking today, 1 through 8 is what Barbara read a moment ago. We're going to look a little more widely than that, but um, this is what Paul says he's learned about Jesus. Now, the theological term for that is Christology. This is Paul's Christology on display here. And his first big idea that I want us to hear again is this. This is the umbrella of Paul's theology, I think, Christology. And that is what God does in and through Christ doesn't depend on us. That, I, I don't know if I could say that enough different ways. I know that's tough for us to hear that. But in just 10 verses, Paul reiterates it three different times. He says, while you were weak, while you were sinners, while you were enemies, you were reconciled. How many of you have been weak this week? <laughs> How many of you have been kind of at odds with God somehow this week? Enemy may be a strong word. Probably none of us adopted that posture. You wouldn't be here this morning. Here's an interesting one. The people who are enemies right now, they have been reconciled to God through what Christ did, and it doesn't depend on them. Paul seems eager to make this point over and over and over again that what God does in Christ Jesus doesn't depend on humanity. It doesn't depend on you. It does benefit you. It affects you. It's there for you. It just doesn't depend on you. Hallelujah, right? That's a good reason to be praising God, as Tom said. Let's praise. It just doesn't depend on us. Now, if I go back to my passport here, I would um, say it this way. You know, this is not a reward for something I've done. It's not an achievement that I've accomplished. I just sign my name and let them take my picture. The Secretary of State is the authoritative agency and will be authoritative whether I sign up for this thing or not. Anthony Blinken is the one who has the agency in the situation, not, not me. I just say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have one of those. Please, yeah. I, 
yeah, look, lucky for me, right? It's not up to me, this thing. This thing has power whether I accept it or not, right? It's not my agency, though. Somebody else's power. Point number one, big idea. I'm going to say it one more time, simply put, that Paul says we are made right with God by trusting God. I'm flying out of the country, and I trust this thing is going to get me in. Not because I'm worth something, necessarily. Because the Secretary of State of the United States has given me access and asked on my behalf that I could have access into what I want to like to see, the wonders of the world. Now, Paul's, um, the previous chapters in Paul's letter, chapters 1 through 4, Paul makes a long kind of um, object lesson out of Abraham. And what he says to the Jewish audience who would have known Abraham's story well is like, like, let's think about Abraham here, people. Abraham was made right with God by what? Not by following the letter of the law, but by trusting what God was doing. Paul makes a long, belabored case about this. Likewise, you and I are made right with God, not by performance or accomplishing the law, but by trusting what another power has done on our behalf. Now, Paul's doctoral PhD type language is justified by faith. I'm just going to say we, we get it by just trusting what God has done for us. Let's reach verse 1 and 2 of this text. Um, you heard it read, but I think we can hover there for a second. Let's just read this together. Therefore, Paul says, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom... We have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. This is the verse I want to hang around here this morning, and I want to, just as a preview, I want to think about Christ as our passport, where this gives us access, us, access to peace with God and to grace, and to hope. Christ is a passport to those things that exist. Christ becomes our passport. So that's kind of a preview where we're going. I want to drill down just on those three things, just briefly. That Paul says that through Christ we have, we have peace with God. Now, uh, how many of us have peace with God right now, to some degree or another? Yeah, I, can, I can taste it. And feel it. And sometimes I was reminded by the hugs that you shared with me just a few moments ago. There's a kind of shalom or a wholeness or a peace. Paul says we have that with God. We have access to that. The universal experience of humanity is that sometimes we're at odds with God. Have you felt that before? Monday. <laughs> In spades. And that is the universal phenomenon of our existence is that humanity is at times and has been at odds with God. The Bible's full of the stories of humanity being at odds with God. Uh, in fact, Adam and Eve got sideways with God early and often. Both Job and Jonah are epic tales of being at odds with God. We have the story of King David. King David waffled into and out of peace with God on a weekly basis. Peace with God. And that's a guy that's after the man after God's own heart, right? Now, being at odds with God is described a whole bunch of different ways in the Scripture. It's described in one place as wrestling with God in the darkness. Has anybody had that before? Jacob did. His life was in shambles, and he wrestled with God and got a blessing out of it, but he limped for the rest of his life. Interesting story in Genesis, the wisdom in that. Or maybe um, you would tune into the way David described being at odds with God. He described it as groaning all day long while his body wasted away and his strength dried up as if a heavy hand was upon him. Anybody had that before? Yeah. One of the things the Bible does so beautifully is it gives language to the experiences that you and I have. 
Being at odds with God is one of those experiences. Paul describes being at odds with God a whole bunch of different ways. He calls it living in futility. Anybody lived in futility recently? <laughs> Paul talks about it as uh, being enslaved. He talks about it as kicking against the goads. All these different ways of talking about being at odds with God. But no matter how we describe being at odds with God, it's almost always an unpleasant characterization. It's not where we want to be. It's where we go. Sometimes we get into those places and stay there for a while. But what Paul's good news is, is that we have access to peace with God. You've been given a passport to peace with God in Christ. Now, um, this being at odds with God is always unpleasant. The word, the theological word is sin. And sin is uh, a word that not only is used as the act of getting at odds with God, but it also describes the phenomenon of being at odds with God. Much like the worry, the word um, hurt functions. Like, I hurt myself, action, and now I'm hurt. I live in hurt right now. Sin works that way in Scripture. I both sin and I exist in sin. Sin is that English word which means dislocated, right? Or missing the mark is the way we used to talk about it. Something off, I'm at odds. Paul says we have access to peace with God. We have access, um, a passport. Now, um, I would like to point out that that access that we have in Jesus Christ, it gives us access to the wonders of God, peace with God. But it doesn't work as an insurance policy to protect us from doing dumb stuff. This is going to get me someplace, but it's not going to protect me from the risks of the world or from jumping off into a volcano or from suffering loss or injury or sickness. This isn't a guarantee against those things or an insurance policy, much the same way. Christ gives us access to peace with God, but it's not a guarantee that you live in that every second. Just look at David. There's a second thing that Paul says in this Christological unpacking, and that is that Christ is our passport to the grace in which we stand. I'll let that sink in for a second. I think most of us live very, very distant from the reality of grace. We talk about grace with children as God's unmerited or undeserved favor, right? That's how you would explain it to a kid. What is grace, Ma? It's God's unmerited favor we would say. It cannot be earned. It is only and always something given. So unlike wages, Paul says. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Grace. Paul says we stand in it. We simply stand in the grace. It's already there. You have access to it. Christ gives us access to stand in grace like a waterfall, I think you said. An unending waterfall. I had a picture of a person standing in this gushing waterfall. Now I wish I would have used it. You have access to this. The 1958 Handbook of Christian Theology defines grace as the attitude of spontaneous, uncaused favor with which God regards humanity. They knew what they were doing in 1958, didn't they? They knew how to talk. The attitude, the attitude of spontaneous, uncaused favor with which God regards humanity. It doesn't depend on you. It's God's attitude we're talking about here. You know, just like Jesus heard right at the very beginning of his ministry, before he did anything, before he earned anything, before he showed any miracles, before he showed off in any kind of way, you know what God said to him? The same thing God says to you. You are my beloved child, and on you my favor rests. It's God's attitude of grace. 
God already loves you. God already thinks you're pretty darn special and wonderful and gracious and tries to show us that in a hundred million ways. Now, I get it. Some of you are going, no, 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 that's just too good to be true, Lance. I know, there's got to be a a catch. I think this notion of grace is really tough for us because we live in an atmosphere or an economy or a situation or an environment or a world that is both anchored in and addicted to achievement as the vehicle to get merit, to earn our merit. Our worth depends on us. Don't work, you don't eat. And that sounds really virtuous and probably a good idea as a rule to live by. But that's not how God works in terms of God's attitude towards us. That, God, that God's already been loving you before you even knew there was a God. God's already been cheering for you even before you knew there was anybody on your sidelines. God's attitude is one of generosity or graciousness to you. Hmm. Is that worth praising God about? God already loved me before I even woke up today. What if the whole world woke up every morning and just got reminded, oh, God's already crazy in love with me. God's already on my side. I don't have to earn it. I don't deserve it. I couldn't possibly garner it. The God of the universe is already on your side. Already loves you. Already wants you not to do dumb stuff so you destruct, you self-destruct. That's grace. An attitude of spontaneous, undeserved favor. Now Paul, um, just like you, by the way, uh, he grew up in the same kind of atmosphere that we live in one that is addicted to achievement, one that is completely anchored in accomplishment. And my evidence for that is if you just notice how many of us track GPAs, quarterly sales, number of followers on social media, net worth, all of those things are just little tiny proof texts that show that we as a culture, we base our value or our vitality on those kinds of achievements. How good were your grades? What school did you go to? How many hours do you have? Like, what, is, what, tell me, what kind of house do you live in? What kind of car do you? We have all of these subtle ways of measuring a person's worth. And you know what Paul says about that? Rubbish. That is the theological word for excrement. It is just as slang as the ones we use today. He had gained all of that. He had earned it. He had a whole wall full of degrees if there were such a thing. He says, you know what? When I was young, I bragged about that stuff as a young person should. But in his maturity, you know what he said? That is rubbish. Grace is the internal paradise that we're all longing for ultimately. That just feels like a shortcut to get there. Grace. And in Christ, we have access to this grace. Christ shows us what is already there, and that is God's favorable attitude towards you. It's always been there. Always been there. How many of you agree that getting in touch with grace is a little tough from time to time? Yeah, me too. Well, Paul's thesis statement, if he had one, we all hold it. The church has said this is the big idea that Paul brings to the world, and let's read this together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Grace is there whether you feel it or not, whether you're in touch with it or not. It's God's favorable attitude toward all humanity, whether humanity notices it or not. Now, um, I know some of us are saying, it's just too good to be true. It can't be. It can't be that way. And I think this is exactly what Paul was warning Ephesus about. Paul says, hey, watch out, because there are powers and principalities against which we will wrestle in this present darkness. There are systems, there are things at play, and I think those things he might have been talking about were the things that keep us striving to get holy or working to get approval or working to get God's favor. I actually think what Paul was warning us against is any such system that functions as a meritocracy. Watch out for that meritocracy. You'll get stuck in the never-ending points program race. You will try to earn your way. It's just inevitable. You will try to earn your way. 
watch out, it's pernicious, that whole construct of earning to get good enough for God's favor. It's the opposite of grace. It took Paul a long time, I think, to come to that reality. That's why he had a whole wall full of degrees, I think. Ooh, we better wrap this thing up here. So how do you get grace? I don't know, maybe you just sign your name and let somebody take your picture. Same way you get one of these. You don't earn it or achieve it, you just sign up for it. Yeah, I'll take one. That's grace. All right, last thing Paul says here in this little section is hope. Paul has, um, he says, Christ is like a passport to hope that one day we will share in the full glory of God. Now, theologically, glory is usually considered as some kind of a future union that is made complete, the glory. We're going to be in this divine human union that is complete, and we think of that as uh, kind of a future endeavor. Meanwhile, um, we stand in grace, and we suffer. In fact, Paul goes on to say, oh, oh, and we also boast in our sufferings. And you're like, there it is. There's the catch. I knew it. There had to be sin of suffering. There had to be sin. I have to earn my way here. Yeah, Paul goes on to talk about sufferings in ways that I had just kind of raised an eyebrow at. I think he may have known something that I don't fully understand quite yet. He says that, great, that our sufferings lead to what? Character. And our character leads to patience. Patience leads to character. And character leads to hope, right? That's this long chain of things that you, earn, you get your way. It leads us to hope. Now, uh, interestingly, it's not just Paul who talks about sufferings here. He actually invites people into suffering. Timothy, his young protege, he says, yeah, you got to join me in these sufferings. And you're like, why would I do that? But you know what? James, Jesus' little brother, also talks about sufferings, right? He says, consider it all a joy, my brethren, when you face various trials. And you're like, really? But it's not just those two. You know what Jesus says? He says, blessed are you when you suffer on my account. And suddenly the evidence is stacking up here that there must be something about this suffering that I just don't quite have clarity about. It leads us somewhere. Now, one of my logical thinkings is it took Paul a great deal of suffering to give up on his wall full of degrees and accomplishments on his wall that he was so proud of. He had to get broken in order to recognize that there's a different reality fueling the universe than all of his accomplishments. He had to get broken. In Acts, you see him on the Damascus Road, right? He gets broken. And then he has to very humbly get nurtured back to health by somebody else. What an aberration for a Westerner. There's something about this suffering. So if the goal of suffering is to break our ego so that we can finally get in touch with grace that comes to us not because we earned it, because God's always loved us, then that kind of makes sense to me. Suffering may break our ego, the essential task of the second half of life. But Paul says here something that I don't know that I fully understand. He says that suffering eventually gets us to hope. And then he makes this interesting comment that I think hope is somehow a landmark, a marker, a road marker or a post or a a sign, hope is this expectation or this anticipation of something that we don't quite grasp yet, yeah? And I think what Paul's saying is that this sense of expectation or hope is related somehow to what God has already put in you. Sometimes we have to get broken before we find it. Oh, it was there with us the whole time. That's Jacob's awakening, right? Oh, God was there the whole time. I didn't even know it. And I wonder if suffering is the pathway in some way, to get us to that hope. Because Paul connects this hope. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Hmm, I hope your path doesn't involve lots of suffering. Well, let me wrap up with this. I'm going to summarize Paul's passport thinking here like this that god has poured out god's spirit from the very beginning in the garden of eden the spirit began pouring out on us it's what makes us human god's breath our bodies breath of god feet of clay it's been going on the whole time that is available to us christ gives us access to see it 
in ways we wouldn't have seen it otherwise. The miraculousness of the grace that's been there the whole time. Jesus Christ gives us access in very visible ways. He shows us what it looks like, I think. In his life and death with us, word made flesh, he shows us God's solidarity with humanity. That God has longed to be with us and beside us the whole time, showing us. And in Christ's death and resurrection, I think, shows us that this spirit of God that is in us, it is unconquerable can't be defeated or diminished, even by death itself. And for me, hearing Paul in this dissertation about what Christ gives us access to, it gives us access to see the things that God has been doing the whole time. I want to conclude with this. William Barclay is a Scottish theologian. He wrote a series of commentaries that are, I think, very helpful and right on. And he, I think, gives us the thought I want to conclude with today, and that is his theological summation of Romans chapter 5. Eugene Peterson says this. I mean, uh, uh, William Barclay says this. Paul is quite clear that this whole saving process, the coming of Christ and the death of Christ, is proof of God's love. Sometimes the thing is stated as if on the one side there was a gentle and loving Christ and on the other side an angry and vengeful God, and as if Christ had done something which changed God's attitude toward men. Nothing could be further from the truth. The whole matter springs from the love of God. Jesus did not come to change God's attitude toward men. He came to show what is and always was. He came to prove unanswerably that God is love. Amen and amen. Any reason to praise God this morning? Because God is love and has always been love and cannot be otherwise. Before you even asked for it, God's love is there for you. While you were an enemy, you were reconciled. Whew. Anybody using a passport this summer? I am, and I hope you will. I'm going to use my little passport to see a waterfall and volcano, but I hope we'll all use Christ as the passport to much bigger and deeper things, things like grace and hope. I pray that we all might encounter not just the global phenomenon that we can see with the passport like this, but that we might experience the passport to the deeper things, this unwavering God that, I mean, this unwavering love that God has already put inside of you, and that in the end, you might actually look like this. Uh, Next slide. That you might look like that. In your soul, that you might look like that. Yeah, let's pray together. Hey, God, we're so thankful that what you do doesn't depend on us. I pray you might help us to open up and rest in the unforced rhythms of your grace. Thanks for loving us. And I pray we let you find us in whatever way we need to be found this morning. Surprise us with your grace. Thanks for giving us uh, our breath and our blood and the bread we share and this community in which we share it. It's all grace. Thanks for being so good. It's in Jesus we see it clearly. Amen.